look at what we got going on tonight. Um, tonight, we are going to be looking at uh, chapter uh, seven in your book, and this is uh, this is uh, thought, language, and intelligence. And um, this is kind of interesting, uh, interesting bit because in a lot of ways, uh, intelligence is one of the things that uh, psychologists do best. In fact, we're really the only profession that has the knowledge, skills, training, and abilities to uh, assess a person's intelligence. And we will uh, define what that is exactly tonight and uh, what that really means. Uh, intelligence, of course, it is kind of a loaded question because um, depending on what environment you are or, where you, or what's going on with you, you certainly uh, could seem intelligent or seem not so intelligent. <clears throat> if uh, you and I were to be transported a thousand years ago uh, in uh, the United Kingdom and plop down in the middle of London, you know, how are we going to function? Uh, everyone's speaking Middle English and you might catch every other word. What are they really saying? It still sounds like a foreign language, so it may not feel like uh, you're very intelligent at all. And you could say the vice versa, if someone was transported a thousand years into the future, what would happen? So you always have to root intelligence in the environment, the culture, and what's going on with uh, that person at that time to be able to really talk about it. <clears throat> so tonight we're going over some of the highlights of, of thought, language, and intelligence. All right, so basic functions of thought. What good is thinking anyway? Here's the circle of thought, and uh, here's my question. Here's my song on the circle of thought. Circle of thought. Describe, elaborate, decide, plan, and act. Circle of thought. I just made that up. How do y'all think? That was pretty good, right? <laughs> that was great. Awesome. See, you know. You just don't get that with every professor, right? You like say, thank goodness we don't get it with every professor, but <clears throat> gotta have a little fun. So basically this describes kind of how our thoughts lead to really our emotions, our feelings in some ways, but also to our behavior and how it is a circle and a kind of a circular way of, of thinking about that or, or looking at that or conceptualizing it. Here's the information processing model. And if it uh, seems familiar, it may, it, one of the reasons is because this is kind of based on how computer programmers and computer system analysts uh, think about information processing the way computers do it. So you have incoming stimulus or information that comes in and your first stage is sensory processing. So in humans, you know, we see something, we taste it, we feel it, we hear it. Uh, we have those different kinds of experiences. And then we have a perception of what our sensory input is. The perception part is a vital, vital stage and it's typically happening outside of our conscious understanding. We're describing and we're elaborating on what the sensory input is. And basically what happens, every single sensory experience that you have is filtered through your memories and all of your experiences in order to conceptualize what even this thing is that you're looking at. If you see something outside of the, of the realm of your experience, then you may say, well, that's weird, or that's an odd kind of situation, or what is that? What, what exactly are we experiencing here? What's going on here? Um, and so, um, you know, that, because it's outside the realm of your experience, you begin labeling it as, as something that's different. So in stage two, three, and four, we have to pay attention, and our memory, both short and long term, are kind of a cycle uh, part of this whole uh, experience. 
So we have a decision making after our perception or our planning to make a decision on what to do with that sensation. We have a response selection, that's our action. And then that turns into the execution of our response, meaning um, our behavior. I'm thirsty. Ah, therefore, I'm going to take my beautiful drink here that is invisible. This is an invisible drink. I'm not, I don't know you knew that, knew that, but uh, it's delicious. And so um, I'm able to drink it. And I just went through the five stages really quickly there. Uh, and every behavior that you have, you can conceptualize it in, in this kind of manner. So mental representations, what are they made of? We have concepts. Formal concepts, natural concepts, prototypes. Um, you know, these are all concepts of every single thing in reality, whether it is matter or energy, or even things that are metaphysical. Does anyone know what metaphysical means? No one's taken philosophy yet. Metaphysical basically means uh, everything that's kind of outside of what we can directly experience with our five senses. So that would include things like paranormal, you know, other dimensions, spiritual things, uh, the concept of God or angels or devils, um, the concept of, of extra dimensional uh, beings or even uh, other universes, you know, all of those different things you could make the argument that they belong to the realm of the metaphysical. Uh, propositions, schemas, scripts, mental, uh, mental modes, mental modes, uh, images, and cognitive maps are all examples of mental representations. So here's an example of a script. Uh, another way to think about a script is, is kind of like an algorithm. Your life, whether you realize it or not, is ran by all of these scripts. You know, you were taught as a young child that there's a certain protocol for when you go to a restaurant, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do, uh, how you're supposed to behave while you're there. You know, and now we have the added, you know, addition of <laughs> what we're supposed to do in restaurants, right? But only as you go in, as soon as you sit down, the COVID virus is impossible, can't get you in the restaurant. But if you stand up, you've got to have the mask back on because then the virus, it, it, it jumps on you and uh, being sarcastic, of course, but I don't understand what those rules are about, but I'm abiding by them so I can eat in the restaurant. <clears throat> but we enter the restaurant, we go inside, we go to a table or we uh, go to the, the hostess or the maitre d' if it's a very fancy French restaurant and uh, we request a table. Um, and it depends on who it is. Uh, there was a Thai restaurant here in, in Claremont where I live. And um, the gentleman who ran that Thai restaurant was named Otto. He had a very strict policy about reservations. If you did not have a reservation, you could not be seated. Well, I knew that he opened at 5.30 and I was very hungry one day and I was all alone. So I went to his restaurant just as he was opening. I went inside and he's standing at the stand and I say, Otto, how are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Dr. Saunders, I said, I'm doing great. Uh, I'd like a table for one, please. Oh, do you have a reservation? And I said, no, I don't. He goes, so sorry. And I went, what? He goes, yep, so sorry. Need a reservation. So I said, okay. So I went back outside. I sat in my car. I called the restaurant. Hello, this is Otto. And I said, <laughs> I said I'd like to make a reservation for one. Very good. When would you like to come in? How about 5.35? Uh, very well, we have availability, we'll see you then. I walk back in. Oh, hello, Dr. Saunders, so good to see you again. Well, what's going on? I said, I have a reservation, uh, Otto, for 5.35. He goes, oh, let me check. Yes, I see it's here, please come in. And then he sat me down. I'm not even kidding you, that actually happened. So, um, you know, he had a little slight variation on, on the protocol we have here, but we get a menu. Uh, we read the menu, we figure out what our food is going to be, and, um, you know, this is always the difficult part. For me, it's very easy. I go to a specific restaurant, 
I pretty much know what I'm hungry for before I walk in. It's very easy for me to order and I sit down. I, I give the order in a short, concise uh, sentence, not a lot of uh, banter back and forth, and that's the end of the story. My wife, on the other hand, will say, well, you know, gosh, the, the salmon or the sirloin both sound wonderful. What do you think? But this vegetarian dish also sounds good. What, what is your favorite? And she'll have this whole conversation with the, um, with the waiter or the server. And then sometimes the server will get the chef and the chef will come out and they'll get involved. And it's like, it takes forever for her to order anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess it must be true love because I really, I, I still put up with it. So we get our food and we eat our food. Then we finally ask for a check. And, you know, my sign is like, hey, can I have the check here? Uh, if, especially if I'm in a hurry, receive the check. And then you want to tip the server, but mostly only in America. That's kind of an American thing. Um, in Europe, um, tipping is usually not expected uh, in uh, restaurants, depending on the country, but for the most part, that's the case. You pay the check and then you say goodbye. So that's our restaurant script. And we have scripts for almost every interaction that we have with other human beings. We have scripts. I have a question. Things and a lot of them that we're unaware of. So here's applying a middle model. Imagine this ball enters the top of this tube. Now follow where the ball goes. Where do you think the ball will exit? <clears throat> will it exit in this straight dot, dot, dot line or will it exit in a curve following uh, these tiny dots or the dashes or the dots? If you had to guess. The dashes. Anybody want to guess? I think you have your mic muted. Can you hear any of us? Oh, you know what? I just realized my sound was off. I hope you haven't been talking and I know where you go. Oh, go ahead. Perfect. Um, I do have a question related to the last slide. Oh, okay. And it might be like slightly off topic. But like you said in Europe, they don't really tip the servers. And like as a server in America, we only get paid five fifty an hour. That's right. Um, so do they make higher wages there? They do. They make higher. They make higher wages. Um, some restaurants in bigger cities have started to actually follow that model. Uh, I know I went to a restaurant uh, just in the last year or so in New York, and one in Chicago, one in Montreal, because Montreal is in Canada. But uh, I went to well, restaurants there, and uh, they specifically say they specifically say we pay our servers a living wage. N tipping is not uh, necessary, uh, or some of them you have even said tipping not allowed. Uh, so I mean, you, you know, you're going to pay more for your food, but you know, in some ways, that's that's nice. Um, and you know, it just depends. And I know some servers who who really like the tipping model because they feel like uh, they can earn. Uh, you know, a higher tip with, with better service or witty banner or however you, they will get the higher tip, but uh, others much rather just have the straight salary. So, but yeah, they're, they, they pay much higher, uh, higher wages in, in, um, in Europe for that compared to, you know, compared to America. So applying the middle model, anyone have an answer for how the ball would come out? Straight. Just dashes. Dashes. I think the dashes too. That kind of seems like that would be the logical way it would work. So what about these images? So if you had to manipulate these images from the left to the right side, A or B, which is correct? Is A B, would that happen in, in reality or or would B? from left to right on A or left to right on B? Which one would be correct? B. B? Possibly. Wait, no, never mind. A. A? It's the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think it probably looks like it's probably A. But it takes a minute, doesn't it? Because you have to kind of conceptualize it. You have to kind of rotate it in your mind and say, would that really work? You know. So thinking strategies, do people always think logically? The answer is no, of course not. Um, <clears throat> human beings don't uh, necessarily think logically. We often do, but sometimes we have a lot of different uh, thinking errors 
or even logical fallacies or different ways that we uh, make assumptions of things. When we are using logic though, as uh, Spock would on Star Trek, our Vulcan friends uh, would use formal reasoning or logic in terms of algorithms. Does anyone know what an algorithm is? Isn't it just kind of like a formula or like a set of steps to solve a problem? Yeah, it's a set of steps or a set of instructions to solve a problem or to carry out a task, exactly right. Uh, there's lots of rules of logic. If you've taken logic or, or philosophy, you probably went over a lot of those. And then deductive reasoning, um, which is kind of interesting. Like, so here's an example of uh, deductive reasoning. Assumption number one, all women want to be mothers. Assumption number two, Jill is a woman. Conclusion, therefore Jill wants to be a mother. Is this necessarily correct? No, of course not, because we, you know, we know um, you can't say, you can't make broad assumptions about a large population uh, because there's always going to be individual differences, regardless of how true you might think that is. Assumption number one, all gun owners are people. Assumption number two, all criminals are people. Conclusion, all gun owners are criminals. <laughs> right? No, not necessarily. You can't make that that uh, assumption either. Uh, I grew up in the deep south, and I am a, a gun owner, and uh, enjoy uh, shooting. I do a lot of skeet shooting now. That's a lot of fun. Uh, all the fun of bird hunting without having to kill the poor animals. Um, just you're just shooting a, a clay target. So potentially problems with heuristics. Uh, you may have an anchoring bias, meaning uh, an original assumption that you made about a certain uh, thing or a concept is anchoring you or keeping you from thinking outside of that, of that box. And um, we get into more heuristics as we, we go along here. So what's the best way to solve a problem? Um, first of all, really the best one of the first steps you have to do to solve a problem is you got to define the problem. What is the problem? What's the problem at all? Um, you know, you find someone that's, for example, cheating on their tax, their income taxes. Uh, and you're a government agent, you know, how do you, your task might be, how do I stop people from cheating on their taxes? Um, you know, one way might be to give incentives so that uh, people are less likely to cheat on taxes because they're rewarded when they don't uh, or to give or to give penalties or punishments when they do cheat on taxes but one way to think about this outside the box is why are there income taxes at all right and that's that is a way uh, to solve a problem for example that it, you're looking at the problem from a completely uh, different different way. Uh, means in analysis or decompensation, decompensation you're trying to uh, understand the uh, uh, problem from, from keeping the end in mind first. Where are we trying to get to? What are we trying to solve? What is the actual problem? So, you know, for example, uh, the end might be we want to stop drug use. That is the end. What are the means of solving that problem? Well, the government decided, federal government decided back in the 1970s that the means to solve the problem of stopping drug use was to create what, what became known as the war on drugs, meaning criminalizing all drugs and um, incarcerating people for, for doing drugs and incarcerating people who um, had anything to do with the drug uh, business at all from manufacturing to the smuggling to the possession to the money laundering to all of those different components of it. But what we have learned over the last 40 years is that it just doesn't work. Uh, people are going to still do drugs anyway. So, you know, looking outside that 
uh, box, you look at a country like, for example, um, Portugal. Portugal uh, basically decriminalized every single drug uh, on the list and instead took all of that money and invested it in uh, rehabilitation and um, helping people to find uh, a different way of uh, managing their problems without having to go to illicit drugs. Uh, which method do you think worked better or, 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 or how do you think Portugal's um, experiment came out? Probably did better than the war on drug. Yeah, they, they did re remarkably better. They, um, they drastically reduced the number of people who were actually were on drugs. It, it, and what they have found even in this country is the moment marijuana became legal in Colorado, the number of teens, uh, teenagers who actually were doing marijuana drastically dropped. Now that was kind of inter interesting to me and I, I, I'm not sure why that was. I mean, I have my own theories about that. But um, I mean, one theory is that teenagers are kind of rebellious and if it was okay to do something, well, that's the last thing I want to do. You know, I want to do something that you're not okay with. So I'm not gonna be doing something that you're, you're okay with. Uh, but that's just my theory. There's no, there's no evidence for that, I don't think, at the moment that I'm aware of. Work backwards from the problem. So, you know, start at the end and, and work toward the beginning. Find analogies for it. Analogies in a lot of ways too are, are, are kind of thought experiments. Uh, you know, you're imagining what would happen if you did X, would that lead to Y? And you kind of debate it out. So here is a, a real world problem. Uh, how did the Wright brothers solve the problem of creating a heavier than air flying machine? Uh, one of the ways they did was use a comparative case study model. The Wright brothers had a lot of spare time to work on their designs. They were familiar with lightweight but sturdy structures that they had used. They actually were bicycle mechanics. So they um, had uh, done a lot of work in, in that uh, realm. So they were already very familiar with creating uh, sturdy structures and, and different things along those lines. They were brothers. They had a good working relationship. They were good mechanics. And they spent a lot of considerable time and energy testing different aircraft components uh, before they field tested their complete machine. Uh, and of course, they they use decompensation, the means in analysis, um, to solve their their issue. And we're flying all over the place today, and it's become uh, so commonplace we don't even think about it. So some more obstacles to problem problem solving is that we create too many hypotheses to test and there's not enough time or not enough resources to test them all. We have different mental sets uh, that keep us inside the box that don't let us solve the problem. We have a thing called functional fixedness, which we look at a problem and because we solved it one way in the past, we believe that's the only way we can ever solve it in the future. We ignore negative evidence, meaning we, we ignore the things that tell us it won't work or we ignore the failures and we only concentrate on the, um, the uh, successes. Does anyone know what confirmation bias is? That's a specific logical fallacy. You seek out information proving what you already think is right and ignore information that could contradict it. That's right, absolutely, exactly right. That's a great example of, of confirmation bias. Um, you know, I think all men are chauvinist pigs. And to show you that that's the case, I have picked out 17 different examples on Facebook that I found of men being chauvinist pigs. And this proves my hypothesis, right? Does that really prove it? You know, no, that's the confirmation bias, right? I was looking for those examples and I, I found those. Uh, wow, social media is terrible with that. Uh, get into an argue, political argument with anybody on Facebook and you'll see good examples of the confirmation bias all, all over the place. So here's the jar problem. This is a good example of mental sets. 
you have the quantity, 21 quarts. And you have jar A, jar B, jar C that have different capacities. And depending on your quantity, how do you distribute it among these different components? So here's the nine dot problem. How do you, without lifting the pin off the page, how would you um, use four lines to connect all the dots without lifting your pin off the page? Kind of think about it. You know, maybe you would do different ways. Would you start here? Would you start there? How would you start? I'll give you the, the answers in a second. Here's an example of <clears throat> functional fixedness. You know, he's holding this rope. How do I get the other rope? I'm trying to figure this out. Sometimes we get stuck because, you know, we're too close to the problem. We have to walk away in order to understand it. Here's a creative solution for the nine dot problem. A lot of people who, are, who solve this problem don't, under, don't realize or don't think about that you can start from anywhere really. And you can go outside of the boundaries of the dots. Many people, when they try to solve this problem, they start, they start inside it and they conceptualize the dots as being a square and that they can't, don't think you can get out of it. So it makes it a more difficult problem than if you, again, kind of thinking outside that box. So how do experts avoid obstacles that limit problem solving? Uh, experts use things called deliberative practice to develop knowledge based on experience. Experts look for analogies between current and past problems. They use chunking. Uh, we had talked about that in, in our memory uh, chapter earlier where that's putting together a series of unrelated data uh, into large chunks to make it easier to remember. The experience helps uh, experts stay calm, reduce emotional related disruptions. Uh, one of the things that you uh, always know is that the calmest person in the room is usually the person who, who is going to stay in charge. You know, if you lose your emotional, emotional calm, if you get outraged and you become um, uh, emotionally volatile, then it, you're, you know, you certainly are losing your control and you're losing your influence on other people. Uh, extensive experience may also help create a lot of mental sets, which helps experts solve problems. Uh, so there's a problem solving by computer or artificial intelligence. You got symbiotic reasoning and computer logic. It's uh, limited because computers have difficulty forming natural concepts. So here's a good example of something that's very easy for humans to do, but very difficult for uh, even artificial intelligence to do currently. All right, so imagine for a moment, you have a debate on a stage between candidate A and candidate B. They, they come on the stage and candidate A says, it's wonderful to see that candidate B is sober today. That's all they say. Now, what does that communicate to you? What does that statement communicate to you? Well, it says they're normally not sober. Well, on the statement itself, it's just saying that they're sober today, so you can't really, without any other details, really, well, people do extrapolate, but you really shouldn't do something just as someone. Yes, uh, you're both correct, uh, actually. That is, uh, that is absolutely true. People do extrapolate from incomplete data and they, they do things called inferences. We take data that we hear and humans will often infer its opposite from the incomplete data or it, it will infer um, what are called implications. You know, that's an implied or an Im implicated 
kind of uh, inference or insult that candidate A is making about candidate B, you know? Now a computer would hear that, it would simply say, okay, I have information that candidate B is sober today. End of story. The computer would not infer that perhaps in other days, candidate B is not sober. Uh, unless you programmed it that way, of course, but uh, that's not something that would naturally happen. So symbiotic reasoning and computer logic is limited because computers that have that difficulty forming natural concepts like we talked about. However, neural network models are beginning to overcome some of that. Uh, and what we're working toward, if you've been following the Elon Musk um, adventures, we are working toward a potential for a human machine teamwork with uh, getting brain implants. I don't know though, uh, would you guys get a brain implant if it would increase your intelligence? I mean, you couldn't pay me enough not you couldn't pay me enough to get one. That's just, there's certain principles behind that and no. Just. Everybody says no. Would, would anybody, would anybody do, would get one? <laughs> Maybe if it wasn't from Elon Musk. Okay. So you don't, you don't trust Elon Musk. So uh, maybe it was, it was from someone else. Yeah, you know, I would, I wouldn't mind like wearing a, a hat or putting a device on my head that it, that enabled me to download information. You know, maybe that would be okay. But uh, having something implanted, you know, that seems to be a road uh, maybe a little bit too far. But there'll be people who do it, I'm sure, if, once it becomes uh, available. So creative thinking is inferred from performance on certain tests and other products resulted from the creative process. Um, you know, when you think about creativity, what do you think of when you think of creativity? What does that mean to you? <clears throat> just like, um, just like thinking outside of the box, like coming up with solutions that a lot of other people don't think of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, you've all probably heard about uh, the space shuttle Challenger exploding. And, uh, you know, that was something that happened in the 80s. Well, a very famous uh, scientist and physicist named uh, Richard Feynman, who is one of my favorite scientists of all time, actually was the one who, during a press conference, because he was actually put onto the president's task force to get to the bottom of why the Challenger, Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, he actually did an experiment right there. And you can, you can still watch the, the video of it on, on YouTube. But he took some of the material from the O-rings, and the O-rings were basically rubberized rings that um, helped to connect different sections of the rocket. And um, he simulated the same circumstances, environmental circumstances that were, that were happening at the time the, the space shuttle exploded. Uh, prior to the space shuttle taking off, uh, the temperature had dipped below freezing that day, which was unusual for Florida, but it had done that. Plus, the O-rings had a lot of pressure on them. So he had a little metal vise, and he took a, a bit of the O-ring material, and he put it into the vise, and he applied about 100, 150 pounds of pressure, and then he put the whole thing, vise, into his glass of ice water, which was around freezing. So simulating the, uh, the same results. And when he took it out after about an hour, the O-ring material crumbled into just crumbles and powder into his hand and it wasn't supposed to do that. So, um, you know, that's a good example of creative thinking that helped to solve uh, that problem. Uh, so the necessary characteristics for creativity one might be expertise in the field of endeavor. Um, Malcolm Gladwell was famous for um, basically saying that you needed about 10,000 hours of practice or experience in order to become an expert in any given uh, field or skill. They have a set of creative skills. They have the motivation to pursue creative work. 
for internal reasons rather than external reasons. Often people who enjoy problem solving or like that sort of thing just like it because it gives them a sense of uh, internal pride or joy or they just like the, the experience of um, having their curiosity satisfied. Uh, really, in a lot of ways, that's the mark of any good scientist is someone who's very curious and is motivated to um, satiate that curiosity. So under some circumstances, creativity may be strengthened by rewards. Uh, in other words, uh, you can actually enhance someone's creativity by saying, if you solve this problem, I will give you this big pile of money or this chocolate cake or whatever else uh, they might want. Uh, some studies have shown that creativity might be inherited, but it's also influenced by your social, economic, and political environment of your country, of course. Um, one thing that separates America, I think, in a lot of ways and why so many inventions that have changed the world have come out of our country is that we give people the space to be creative. We give them the freedom to be creative and we give them the freedom to fail. If someone has failed in a business, we don't, ne we don't say uh, necessarily that you are you know, shamed for all time. Uh, no, we say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try, try again. If you make a mistake, try, try again and keep going until you're, until you're successful. Um, so it, uh, does, it have, does one have to be smart to be creative? It does help to have a certain amount of intelligence, but you don't have to be a genius to be creative. creative creativity involves divergent thinking, meaning outside the box, not convergent thinking. Um, a lot of studies have actually shown that people who are straight A students in high school tend to be more conformists rather than uh, uh, those who think outside the box. There's an old saying that um, straight A students become academics, uh, B students become government employees, and C students become businessmen. <laughs> And a, you know, in a big part of that way, uh, it, it's interesting because I found that in my experience uh, to be true uh, on some level. Although I've been all three, I've been an academic, which I am now, and I've been a, a business a businessman, and I have been a um, a government bureaucrat as well. So uh, maybe that's because I made A's, B's, and C's. So I, I kind of hit, hit the hit the highlights on it. So intelligent creativity combined to contribute to this thing we call wisdom. Uh, intelligence is really, um, when it's added to experience, then you get, uh, you get wisdom. So what influences creativity? We know that biological aspects can certainly have an influence on it. Uh, some people are even trying to teach creativity. You know, again, I think giving people the space to do things uh, one of the things I let my kids do is, is tinker. Uh, I would buy old radios and things at, um, at flea markets or thrift stores and give it to them to take apart if they wanted to and just take a look at it, see what, how it works, what does it do? Can you put it back together? You know, what, do, what, where, what goes where and what goes where? And it really helped them to, to become um, very proficient in fixing things. Uh, when it needed to be fixed because they kind of began to understand how all that was put together. Uh, thinking outside the box, you know, what does that mean for you? Being able to think in a way that is not necessarily uh, anchored to social conventions. So how do you become a better decision maker? Um, a lot of times people might make risky decisions. So how do you evaluate those options? One is you look at, um, you know, what's the practicality or what's the utility of a particular option that you're trying to decide on? And what's the expected value of that decision? You can look, this, look at this as it is applied to your major. So why did you pick the major that you chose? Anybody want to tell me what their major is and why did you pick it? I guess I'll go. I picked digital media with game design specialty because I see game design as a way of just being able to express people 
myself artistically in multiple different ways because video games are just foundations of multiple different types of art shoved all together. So. Yeah, great answer. So, uh, you know, apply the, the, the idea or the thought to uh, video games and um, see it as a work of art. It's, it's it has an aesthetic value. It's, uh, it's satisfying that um, artistic side of you that you feel like you want to want to uh, uh, satisfy. And then hopefully, of course, you'll make a, a lot of money in it. I know people who uh, design a, a game that becomes quite popular can become quite wealthy overnight, I'm sure. Um, I'm old enough to be the first generation to actually go from the analog world, you know, transistor radios and TV and all that kind of stuff to the digital world. Um, I was around in the early 80s when the very first uh, personal computers hit the market. And uh, learned how to program early on, and uh, figure out how to how to do all of that. And it was really fascinating. And I've I've tried to stay current with computers as they've gone along, but a lot of the early video games, uh, some of them were text based, and some of them, you know, had the eight bit graphics, which were or fun to look at now in hindsight. They look so primitive, but um, some people still program in eight bit graphics because they just like the aesthetic of it. So we have biases and flaws in our decision making. One is loss aversion, meaning I don't want to take a risk because I'm afraid of the loss that might occur. And I'm overly focused on the loss and so I, uh, I don't make the decision. Or we have a bias on how we think about probability. We overestimate probability of rare events. Um, the media is very uh, good about this. It's very, it, it takes very rare events. It over publicizes them and it turns them into examples uh, in people's minds of things that seem to be happening all the time. Um, you know, crime is a good example of that. You, you have a lot of crimes that are sometimes become national news stories and it gives people a false sense that crime is very prevalent and it's always increasing and it's something that happens all the time. When in fact, all the statistics shown that over the last 30 years, crime has, uh, has dramatically fallen uh, and it has not uh, really increased, but we tend to overestimate those rare events. We underestimate the probability of frequent events, uh, for example, or, or even our own contribution to those uh, frequent events. Uh, the gambler's, gambler's fallacy is a fallacy that just because one series of outcomes have happened in a row must mean then that the opposite outcome is just around the corner and should happen the next time. So, you know, a, an example in gambling is if you, if you go to the roulette table, there's 38 different numbers on the roulette wheel plus zero and double zero. And so they spin the wheel and they roll the ball around and the ball runs around, around, around the wheel and then it drops on one of those numbers. So what is your chance of, of getting one of those numbers? You know, one in 40, I guess, right? And then, uh, and then it will pay you, pay you, uh, 35 to one, 38 to one, or it pays you different things. What happens a lot of times with people who play roulette is that they'll have on a screen what has been, what numbers have been selected or chosen at random um, over time. And you'll, and you'll have people, because it's hit red numbers 10 times in a row, people will go, all right, everybody bet on black. Black is ready to happen now. But in truth, every single spin has an equal chance of being anything. It's still, it's still, it's all random. It's still random. That's the gambler's fallacy. And then of course we are unrealistically confident uh, in the accuracy of our predictions uh, often. 
So uh, here's the judge. This was very familiar to me today. I was uh, in court all day long on Zoom. Uh, boy, I tell you, Zoom court is is really bizarre. What a strange situation. We don't, you know, you're not even going to go into the court anymore unless you're in some you're in Seminole County. And for whatever reason, in Seminole County, uh, Florida, uh, they're still having face to face uh, judicial uh, court hearings. They uh, keep going, so they haul me out to Seminole County sometimes, and I have to wear a mask the whole time on this on the stand, which is. Uh, which is no fun. All right, so here's group interactions can shape the outcome of a group decision. Sometimes you can lead to extreme decisions called group polarization. Uh, you see this happening uh, now in social media and how people are able now through the confirmation bias to select their news sources and their information sources in such a way that allows them to stay within a bubble. Uh, and it, it creates a sense of polarization where their whole understanding of where they are on the political spectrum or where they, where they see reality is so skewed because they're only seeing information from one side. So it's real important to get outside of those uh, bubbles for yourself and, um, and see, see things from other people's perspective. If you are unable to argue either a political, a metaphysical, or a philosophical uh, question from every side, if you can't argue it from every side convincingly, then you really don't understand the issue at all. Uh, and that might be a good example uh, that, le or a good indication that tells you that you are in the middle of a group polarization sort of um, circumstance. So are people better at problem solving and decision making in groups? Sometimes it depends on the obviousness of the solution. People often will begin social loafing and group think. Uh, you see this when your uh, professors force you into group projects. I always hear moans and groans from students when I assign group projects because you know, you've got that one OCD student who's got to do it perfect. And then you have all the, you have the two or three people in the group who just kind of ride the coattails everyone else and uh, do the minimal possible, uh, expecting someone else to do the work. And then group think can be a difficult situation because you get into a, a, a point where um, people begin to just simply agree with one another to get along. That's group think. And brainstorming is not necessarily a beneficial uh, because it, it can just be another form of group think if people aren't really conscious on, on what they're doing. All right, so language. How do babies learn to talk? Through symbols such as words. Um, uh, every language has its own grammar. We have an understanding of, of how to combine those symbols into something that, that's understandable. In our first year, uh, you know, we're we're talking to the baby, we're making cooing sounds, we're telling the baby how beautiful the baby is or how sweet the baby is. And um, we're trying to communicate those things. And the baby begins to learn almost immediately that these sounds that they are hearing that are coming from their caregivers have a meaning. You know, drink, this is the drink. You know, oh, here's the milk for you. You know, let's play. You know, all of these different words have meaning and then we ascribe that meaning to the child through, through our own behavior. Uh, in the second year of a, a person's life, you have the one word stage of speech and that lasts about six months. The child will go up, you know, they'll lift their hands up, meaning pick me up or milk or, um, and often the parents know what they mean. Uh, around 18 months, vocabulary will begin to expand dramatically. And by two years, they begin to combine words into telegraphic or two word sentences. And then three sen word sentences uh, come up next. By age three, they begin to use uh, auxiliary verbs, create complex sentences, and even ask questions. Three is the why stage. Why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Why won't daddy stop drinking? Why is mommy always smoking in the closet? 
you know, on and on and on. Hopefully those weren't your, uh, your questions as a child, but uh, they are for some kids, unfortunately. By age five, you have, they have acquired most of the grammar rules of, of their native language. Um, we learned grammar possibly through positive reinforcement, through modeling or imitation, or just through analyzing how the language is, is used. Uh, and we tend to pick it up in a very automatic kind of way, uh, depending on what language you use, or even if you, you, if you have become bilingual, uh, we know that people uh, are perfectly capable of creating complete separate grammar, sense of grammar rules for different languages that they, that they know as they learn it, especially if it's in children. Uh, one researcher, Chomsky, said we're born with the built-in universal grammar, and that might be genetically encoded. Humans may be genetically encoded for, for language. Uh, language development reflects the development of more general sensory perception and cognitive skills, and there's evidence that we're pre-wired for it. But what's fascinating is a lot of the animals that we have as pets, like dogs, for example, we're beginning to learn that they also are actually pre-wired for human language. That, to me, that's really fascinating. Uh, and we know that dogs, for example, can learn uh, sometimes upward of 100 words or even more, uh, understand their meanings, ascribe a word to a specific object or a word to a certain behavior. Um, so it's certainly not limited to humans. Uh, other animals on the planet also uh, can understand that as well. Uh, people can learn uh, languages simultaneously. People who are bilingual tend to show greater cognitive flexibility, concept formation, and creativity. Um, and you have a much bigger cognitive reserve in old age. The bigger your cognitive reserve, the further away you can push dementia. And the further away you can push dementia, the longer you're going to have a healthy, uh, vibrant uh, life. So. We all want to do that. All right, testing, uh, intelligence. So what is intelligence? Who can define intelligence for me? Intelligence is probably like, I don't know, how big brain you are, how much you can like do uh, with your brain, like how quick it is and how um, effectively you use it. How quick it is, how how big it is, how much you know, and how uh, how much you can do with it. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of those are absolutely components of intelligence. Uh, what other way? What what other uh, ways could you define intelligence? Anyone else have any ideas? The ability of the brain to process information. Information processing, absolutely. That's certainly a component of intelligence as well. So we know that the characteristics of intelligence is things like abstract thinking and reasoning abilities. So, you know, our, our ability to think about abstract concepts, concepts like love and patriotism and um, even concepts uh, um, pertaining to creating a, a kind of a, um, a thought experiment. You know, what if you were able to go back in time and meet your own grandfather, but then you accidentally killed your own grandfather? What would happen? Uh, would that create a paradox? You know, that's an example of a thought experience, experiment and, and uh, a little bit of abstract thinking. Helps to give us problem solving abilities. Uh, one of the biggest ways that a lot of psychologists and neuroscientists um, define intelligence is really the ability to solve problems that you have not encountered before. Solving novel problems is an absolute characteristic of, uh, of intelligence. And we see that primates are able to do this. Uh, birds, crows, for example, are one of the most intelligent um, uh, avian creatures, bird creatures there are. Uh, pound for pound, um, crows have one of the largest brain to body ratios. They have immense brains in, in relation to their bodies and are able to solve very complex problems. And then the capacity to acquire knowledge and even pass along or teach it to other people. So um, early on in the 20th century and even a little bit before, there was um, 
some efforts to try to figure out how do you measure intelligence and what is intelligent. Uh, a fellow by the name of Alfred Binet back in 1904, he wanted to figure out uh, can French children who were doing poorly in school be identified? Could you identify them prior to them doing poorly? With his ultimate goal was that we can, if we can identify these children, we can give them extra tutoring that might bring their mental abilities or intelligence more up to task. So he developed a set of mental tasks that became the model for the current intelligence tests. Benet's assumptions were that reasoning, thinking, and problem solving all depend on intelligence. And therefore, if you can measure those uh, things with, with different tests or components, you could get a general understanding of what that child's intelligence or cognitive abilities might be. He also assumed that children's cognitive abilities increased with age. So the Stanford Binet intelligence test became the hallmark for, um, in a lot of ways, how we think about tests today. IQ or the intelligence quotient uh, was conceptualized by Stanford Binet and it, that meant mental age divided by your chronological age times 100 gave you your IQ or your intelligence quotient. And that allowed a ranking of people based on their IQ. Uh, these, uh, these two tests are, the, are two that I use and are widely used in, in psychologists today. The Wessler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wessler Intelligence Scale for Children. Uh, I use those all the time for a variety of reasons. Um, I often will use them as a cognitive test to try to understand if a person has a learning disability or if they have lost um, cognitive capacity uh, following a stroke or a head injury or, or things like that as well. The Stanford Binet is still around. Uh, I don't use that particular test. Um, it's, uh, it's long and it's uh, not as easy to give uh, or standardized as, uh, as these other two. But the Stanford Binet intelligence def test, one of, its, um, one of its strengths is that you can test children as young as two all the way up to adults going all the way up to 100. And there's a variety of different ways uh, that you do that depending on the child's, uh, the child's age or the person's age into adulthood. So here's performance of items similar to those on the Wessler Intelligence Scale. Like for example, I'll give this test to you. If you look at this uh, buggy here, or this little cart, what's missing from the picture? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, the fourth wheel. The fourth wheel, very good. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, for whatever reason, I often give people say, the baby. <laughs> Where's the baby? <laughs> is missing. And that's the incorrect answer. We have the fourth, the fourth uh, front wheel is right. So here's block design. Um, you give people a number of blocks, and then you show them a diagram, and you say, take these blocks and put them together to form this picture. And then you time how fast they're able to do it. That tests things like visual spatial acuity. Um, it tests um, cognitive processing speed. You know, the faster you're able to do it, the higher your points are. So here's the distribution of IQ in the general population. So the average John Doe, Jane Doe in the um, population of the United States and Canada have an IQ of 100. That is the mean. If you go one standard deviation from the mean, which is 15 points, then you have 68% of the people have an IQ that falls in somewhere between 85 and 115. That's 68% of the people. If you go two standard deviations outside from the mean, then you have 98%, I think, or 95%, 95% of all the people in the United States and Canada fall in between 70 and 130 IQ points. 
2.5% of the population fall below 70, 2.5% of the population fall above 130. Um, where do you think the average physician falls on the IQ scale? What, what, would, you, what would you think the average physician's IQ would be? Anybody want to guess? Uh, isn't it about 125? 145, is that what you said? I said 125. 1.5? 1. 125, sorry. 125, okay. Yeah. 125. Okay, good, good guess. What, anyone else want to guess? 125 is not right, but you're, you're close. Yeah, the average, the, believe it or not, the average IQ of, of the average physician in the United States is 111. That's the average IQ. Of course, you know, you got physicians who are probably over 130. Um, if you, two standard devi deviations above the mean, by the time you hit 130 and above, you're considered in the gifted or, or quote unquote genius range for intelligence as it is defined um, by psychologists on, in the test. Uh, if you fall under 70, you're considered to be intellectually disabled. They used to call that uh, mentally retarded, but um, that, um, that uh, has fallen out of favor that no longer is used. It's now intellectually disabled. Uh, or intellectual uh, deficit or disability. So how good are IQ tests? Well, first of all, what you have to understand, and one thing I try to explain to parents is that um, the kind of intelligence that IQ test, and really any standardized academic test, like the ACT or the SAT or the GRE, uh, which really in a lot of ways are just um, different kinds of intelligence tests in a, in a different way. All of those tests are, are simply uh, measuring a person's ability to perform well academically and get along in the current, current society of, uh, of Western culture uh, and mostly English speaking Western culture because those particular tests are uh, designed for English speakers. There are tests IQ test designed for um, non-native uh, English speakers, test designed in other languages, and uh, there's even tests, IQ tests that are designed to be um, not language dependent. So you're looking at think, looking at um, pattern recognition and such. Um, but there's, you know, it, it's not the end all be all. There's a lot of different kinds of intelligence. Uh, you know, there's musical ability, which not, is not a shared, not at all um, uh, tested by IQ tests. There's mechanical ability. There's the ability to, to uh, survive in the wilderness. There is artistic creativity. Um, there are, you know, even common sense kinds of um, ways to solve problems. None of that stuff is, is really tested in the IQ test. And all of those are, are forms of intelligence. And, um, and those are important things to keep in mind. Uh, one of the, and also one of the things that I often tell parents is that IQ is not fixed. Um, you know, whenever their child gets, to, gets an IQ result, all that means is that at that given point in time on that day, this is how they were able to perform. To, to perform. And even then, uh, there's a range given that their true IQ may fall in between a, a 10 point range or a five point range, depending on how accurate uh, you might want to be. Okay, so evaluating the, the value of IQ tests, there's statistical reliability, there's a degree to which test result or other research evidence are repeatable or stable. So we want to make sure if we give you an IQ test today and we give you the same test tomorrow, we should get the same result. Uh, that's reliability. Validity is, are we actually using a test and interpreting it in a way that truly measures what we say it is measuring? Um, so, you know, what do you think? Uh, does, does every person who does well on the SAT, do they do well in college? Because that's what it's supposed to do 
it's supposed to tell you. The higher score you do in GRE, allegedly the best, better you do in college. Is that always true? I wouldn't think always. What other factors do you think would, would play into someone's college success? Uh, creativity, motivation, uh, mm -hmm. attention span, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all of those. Motivation in particular uh, is actually uh, motivation and determination are actually more highly correlated with college success and success generally than intelligence is. So, you know, people's determination and their motivation to complete something uh, is highly correlated to, to those things, more, much more so than intelligence by itself. And it's not a perfect measure of smartness. And there's a stereotype threat of, of that as well. So you gotta be careful for that. Intelligence is certainly a developed ability. Um, you know, the more you read, the more you understand, the more things you expose yourself to, the more museums you go to, the more art you listen, the more music, the more different people from different cultures that you expose yourself to. Um, you know, all of those things help to increase your, your overall intelligence. Uh, there's genetic uh, studies that also uh, correlate intelligence with biological factors on some level. Um, but mostly that's related to health, uh, not related to much of anything else. So here's correlations of IQ. Identical twins reared together, their IQ typically is highly correlated, which does give some evidence for genetic basis of it. Identical twins reared apart, non-identical twins reared together, siblings reared together, siblings reared apart, unrelated children reared together. So environment does play a big factor. And then unrelated children reared apart have almost no correlation between their IQ. So there definitely is an interplay between genetics uh, and environment here. So important consideration, the group scores do not necessarily uh, describe individuals within that group. Inherited characteristics are not necessarily fixed. There's a lot of socioeconomic differences that um, can certainly play into uh, people's ability to uh, increase their IQ or, or be very smart. And I, I know one of, the, one of the great privileges I had growing up was being surrounded by books. My parents loved books and so did my grandparents. Plus we had a great library in my little town and my grandparents saw value in taking me there. Uh, and so I was exposed to books very early on in my life and I grew to love books. Uh, and today I have books everywhere. I have uh, <laughs> more books that I know what to do with sometimes. And um, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there can be ethnic differences, but there's a variation within ethnic groups is much greater than variation among ethnic groups in the human population. Uh, and environmental differences probably play a, a much bigger role. So here's a good example of a representation of ethnic group differences in IQ. You have African Americans, Hispanic Americans, European Americans, and Asian Americans, and how they fall with their averages can come together and you have geniuses of all ethnic groups. You have people who uh, are um, intellectually disabled in all ethnic groups as well. Um, and what they have found in a lot of ways is that uh, cultural considerations as well as socioeconomic factors, historic factors uh, play into all of those sorts of things. Um, and then even the kinds of questions that are asked might be put uh, a person into a bias uh, that they don't necessarily understand. Like for example, um, there's a question on one of the IQ tests where it, at, it asks you to point, there's a group of pictures and it asks you point to the beaver. Where is the beaver? 
Well, beaver, a beaver is an animal that is native to North America. For a little girl that I was testing who was from Pakistan and had just arrived to this country, she had never heard of a beaver and never had never seen a beaver, never read stories about beavers, had no idea what a beaver word was. And in fact, even though she spoke, spoke English, that was the first time she'd ever heard the word beaver. And so um, uh, this little girl was quite intelligent and she spoke five different languages uh, and uh, all of them fluently, but um, that was a biased question. Uh, and so I had to figure out a way to uh, ask her other questions that, that weren't necessarily biased to her culture or to her upbringing. So why do you think there's a positive correlation between socioeconomic status scores and IQ tests? Well, we kind of answered that a little bit uh, earlier. Parents' jobs and status related to their own intelligence, you know, and children watching their parents. Um, you know, they're watching their parents reading. The parent is, is demonstrating by their behavior that this, this thing is of value. Um, you know, I used to love to read stories to my two sons and I would act out. I would act out the different, uh, different voices and such and, and, and really give them a love of reading because it, it was exciting. The parent's income affects quality of the child's environment. Uh, the more money you have, the more you're able to have a rich, you know, a, a rich life in terms of um, rich in learning opportunities and rich in things that you can have. You have books, of, books from museums and books about the great uh, works of art in the world and um, even having a globe and being able to spin the globe and see the different countries and where things are in relation to where you live, you know, all of those things uh, help to uh, increase a child's IQ. Uh, motivational differences between socioeconomic levels. There's a lot of uh, evidence to show that people who are middle class, upper middle class, uh, tend to be more motivated to perform well academically than people who are in the upper class. So, you know, if you're a trust fund kid, why work so hard? Um, or if you are incredibly poor, people who are very poverty stricken, um, they may be too busy just trying to survive, you know, finding food, clothing, and shelter, and not having a lot of motivation to do much of anything else. Uh, again, differences among people in all of those different uh, regards as well. So those with higher IQs may have greater opportunities to earn more money. Uh, that does seem to be the case, although um, intelligence and material wealth are also not necessarily correlated. Again, motivation tends to be more highly correlated with material wealth than uh, intelligence alone. So cre thinking critically, are IQ tests unfairly biased against certain groups? Um, I kind of already answered this with my Pakistan child um, example. Uh, they are biased against uh, different cultural groups. It just depends on uh, you know, what they are. They're also biased in some ways to regions. Um, you know, if you were like me and you grew up in the state of Florida, when you run across an IQ question that asks you, ask you about coal uh, or, or um, ask you about oil furnaces, never heard of an oil furnace <laughs> growing up in Florida, never needed an oil furnace, you know, and barely got below 50 degrees, much less uh, needing a big oil furnace. So. When, it, you know, when I would read a question like that to a child who grew up in Florida, uh, I would almost always over explain it to just give it to them because I knew it was very culturally uh, biased. And then tests may reward those who interpret questions as expected by the test designer as well. So those are things to think about. So here's an intelligence test. What fictional detective was created by Leslie Chartres? What dwarf planet travels around the sun every 248 years? Wow. Is that Pluto? What vegetable yields the most pounds of produce per acre? Anybody want to answer any of these questions? Why 
What kind of animal is Dr. Doolittle's push me, pull you? Yeah, I know none of these. So I guess my IQ is negative. <laughs> uh, I think this is a test from the late 1800s. So that might be one reason why we're having trouble with it. I think Dr. Little's push me, pull you was a, uh, was a llama. Uh, what vegetable yields the most pounds of produce per acre? Hmm, potatoes probably, maybe, I don't know. So can that evidence be interpreted? Are IQ tests unfairly biased against certain groups? Traditional IQ tests provide a fair test of likelihood of success in school or certain jobs. But IQ scores measure developed not innate abilities. Again, um, you can increase your IQ with study and, uh, and with your own, and your own motivation. Um, cultural fair tests will not be useful if they fail to predict academic or occupational success. So sometimes you have to kind of live with a culturally biased IQ test because what you're attempting to show or what you're attempting to predict uh, needs the cultural bias built in because you're really trying to predict a person's ability uh, to succeed in that particular culture. So value-free, experience-free, or culture-free tests of intelligence probably are not possible. We all have our own implicit bias. The creators of the test have their implicit bias. The uh, psychologists who give the test have uh, implicit bias, meaning bias that they're not even realized that they, that they may have. Uh, attention should be focused on how to help develop abilities necessary for success. That's absolutely true. And we want to help uh, everyone figure that out. The diversity in intelligence, is there more than one type of intelligence? Yep, you got analytical, creative, practical intelligence. You know, analytical intelligence is a, a big part of the kind of intelligence we need to make a grades in school. And the creative intelligence, gosh, I'm always amazed at people who are able to, you know, paint a picture or to play the cello or um, sing a song, or do you know, amazing creative tasks. Uh, that certainly is an, a kind of intelligence that's, that's um, quite valued in our culture. And then practical intelligence, you know. Um, gee, you know, how do I solve the problem of getting my driver's license at the DMV? And what's the easiest way to, to go through that Byzantine you know, governmental bureaucracy system? I need someone with practical intelligence to help me with that, or how do I fix my car, or this radio is not working, what's wrong with it, can you, can you help me fix it? So here's an example of tests for practical and creative intelligence, uh, and it may be uh, helping thing, them to kind of think outside that box again. These are, this is kind of fascinating, and I encourage you to go back and uh, read over it and see how well you do on it. Gardner's multiple intelligence includes things like linguistic or language intelligence, logical, mathematical, spatial, visual intelligence, music, body kinesthetic intelligence, you know, great gymnasts and dancers, that's a great uh, ability or intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence. My youngest son um, has a lot of intrapersonal or emotional intelligence, and they have the, he really has the ability to make friends wherever he goes. He's very charming. The moment he walks in the room, you, you know, it kind of lights up. He's one of those people. Um, he's never been very academically gifted, but because he has such great interpersonal intelligence and emotional intelligence, there's no doubt in my mind that he will be um, very successful. Or naturalistic uh, intelligence, that, you know, the ability to survive in the world, know what plants to eat, what plants not to eat, uh, what are the animals doing, you know, what's the weather ha going to happen? What's happening next? You know, those sorts of things. And uh, the old pioneer skills, uh, those are intelligences that we have lost a lot of. Uh, if you've ever seen the show, The Walking Dead, uh, they really exhibit a lot of those kinds of uh, naturalistic intelligence in the post-apocalyptic times. So unusual intelligence, you have giftedness, uh, children or adults who have that uh, ability to just come to the answers immediately, solve things really quickly. 
they usually do really well on Jeopardy and uh, are able to, you know, go through ding, 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 Ken Jennings, you know, on Jeopardy, the great, uh, greatest player of all time who ever played that, uh, that game uh, had that great ability. Intellectual disabilities. Sometimes there are genetic or inherited causes for those. There are specific genetic uh, mutations that may cause uh, a, an intellectual disability. Maybe environmental causes, such as um, being exposed to lead uh, early on in your childhood. Um, lead can actually cause de point decreases in IQ. Uh, and then sometimes there's no obvious genetic or environmental cause. And there's just some unknown interaction that we don't understand that's causing or that has created the um, environmental or the, the intellectual disability. Here's the range of intellectual disabilities. So 50 to 70, that's the majority of intellectually disabled people. Um, often, you don't even know you're talking to them. You know, it might just be kind of a run of the mill Joe or run of the mill Jane, you know, they may be your server or uh, someone you, you see in a unskilled job and, um, you know, they're reading and writing and they're just kind of getting along in the world. Um, moderate uh, often gets a little bit worse. You're looking at someone in with a ability range very similar to a four to seven year old. Severe and profound uh, is very limited. You know, these are people who are severely, typically developmentally disabled and uh, often need um, round the clock care or uh, communication uh, or observation or supervision. All right, so how individuals with mild intellectual disabilities differ from each other, depending on really their functional abilities. Um, I've seen people who test out very poorly on the IQ test and, and certainly test out in the intellectually disabled range, but functionally, they're driving a car and they're, you know, living their life and managing uh, their house household and doing okay. So it just depends on, on the situation. So how do you improve cognitive abilities? One is to provide positive parent-child communication. That certainly does. And you want to mainstream people with intellectual disabilities. What we have discovered is that when you keep people with disabilities or even gifted people apart from the average students, really everyone then uh, is not helped by that. By putting them all together, you, it's kind of like the rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, every, all the kids and the students are able to help one, one another and you have a, a more of a, a rise in, in the overall average IQ. All right, that's your test on intelligence for tonight. Any questions for any of that stuff? Good to see y'all. Thank you. Take care Thank and uh, see you in two weeks, midterm next week. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Thank see you. Bye-bye. Take care.